So Kristen suffers from this very rare disorder where essentially the second she gets horizontal, she falls asleep. I'm going to call this disorder horizontalism. Horizontitis. Horizontitis. <laughs> This pickleball life. Yo, what up, PB lifers? It's your girl, Jilly B and K Dubs, and welcome to this pickleball life episode 10. 10. They say 92% of podcasters do not make it to 10 episodes. I made that statistic up, but stats I did not make up. Everything going into this heavily researched episode. It's pod number 10, and do we have a rhyme? I just asked you. It's going to be Ben. <laughs> We're going to see Jen. I actually Jen. had a rhyme last night. It's pod number 10. It's our recovery den. Oh, I knew you'd have something. That is right. On this episode 10, we are celebrating that I have taken almost an entire week off of pickleball. So wow. in honor of that, we're going to count down the top 10 recovery devices, habits, and performance optimization hacks, things that have helped me go from sitting in a desk chair 14 hours a day, running duper, working at Major League Pickleball, to 90 days later. You know what they say, sitting is the new smoking. That's true. To 90 days later, top 25 in the world in pickleball, multiple top 10 finishes on the PPA Tour, and a second place in my first appearance at MLP's Challenger League in Daytona, all without injury or er, a uh, major injury, I should say. <laughs> of course, there have been some speed bumps. Head bumps. On the injury road along the way, but hey, uh, we wouldn't be able to do this pod without those. Oh, is there like some wood for me to, to knock on? I thought on? that's what your head bump was. <laughs> oh man, if you've listened to this podcast before, you know I've said that my success on the court is now way more about what I'm doing off of the court than anything else. That means strengthening and taking care of our bodies. So Kristen, talk to me about our four cornerstones of health, our philosophy on health before we hop in. These are the bedrock of what we believe helps keep a body as a temple in pickleball. The first, thou shall not overdo it. Well said. Uh, for me, on days I train on court, I pretty much don't do much else. I don't get home. I don't do weightlifting. Doesn't um, play golf with me anymore. That's true. I will not play golf and pickle in the same day. Hey, I, do you still play golf? <laughs> I've been sneaking it in. Oh, yeah. You just got new clubs. PXG just sent Kristen a set of clubs. If, I, if I'm not uh, making enough in prize money on the tour in the next couple of months, I'm hawking those clubs. <laughs> right after we hawk all those pickleball paddles. <laughs> totally. Look for us on, a, on a eBay. It's at this pickleball life. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I'll stretch and do some recovery on my non-on-court days and use recovery. Jill is a very diligent stretcher. Ugh. I it could is be better. Impressive. Thank you. I'll use recovery devices that we'll take you through in a little bit, show you what my routine looks like. But yes, don't overdo it. I tell my mom, mom, you're always injured in pickleball because you're playing three, four days in a row. I barely play three days in a row. Yeah, if I play three days in a row, I try one to be like morning and then a night. So it's like a day and a half ish or like half a day in between, I should say. The other thing is after a tournament or a super heavy training schedule, like if I'm playing three days in a row, I'll try and take one to two days completely off, especially coming home from a tournament. Um, I don't even stretch. I'm just like, I, what do you call this state of like non-being? Like lying down, staring at the wall, letting yeah. my mind and Stare body recover. Stare important. at the wall time. It's also called meditation. <laughs> yeah, it's meditation. There you go. Meditation is not part of our cornerstones, but I do think that many people find it helpful for their mental health. All right, what's cornerstone so number, number two? So number two, 
Thou shall find a bodywork specialist. Mm -hmm. So for me, you know, I've got a team of people. No, I don't fully employ them, but uh, I'd like to. <laughs> Hashtag goals. Um, for me, an ART, an uh, active release technique specialist, mm -hmm. chiropractor, if you can combine them both, uh, they are the absolute best. There's, they're really hard to find because it's very intensive what they do. Um, I thought you just went on Google and said, find an ART specialist near uh, me. No, I didn't. Um, <laughs> it's difficult on the provider's body. It's super hands-on. It's yeah, a non-invasive. I, mm -hmm. I will have some footage of you getting uh, adjusted on. at MLP Daytona mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. your hip. But basically, ART is this combination of like pressure points plus moving limbs around to get the fascia to like get rubbed over the elbow that they're pushing on, if you could picture that. But playing pickleball and taking care of your vo your bodies, like it, it requires a village, truly. Yeah, absolutely. And that kind of leads us to our next pillar, you know, seek multiple opinions. Um, my elbow was hurting me three weeks ago. I saw three different people, not physicians. I saw um, my acupressure uh, body works uh, helper here in the desert. I saw two different chiropractors in Newport Beach and each had a different opinion. And it was the very last one I saw. And, you know, isn't it the last place oh, you yeah. always look? Always the last place you look. Who is my ART chiropractor who said, oh, that's Fencer's elbow. You know, you need to strengthen your bicep because your bicep is what stops an overextension of your elbow, which once he explained that, it made uh -huh. total sense. It's always the recoil, right? Recoil. Or like in my case, I have the torn ACL. It's the deceleration. I always tell people, I can run. Right. I just can't stop. Right. Thank God there is a net there. <laughs> You're the only person who thinks of the net right and pickleball it. there to catch you. <laughs> <laughs> like a warm blanket. Oh, but in all seriousness, thou shall seek multiple opinions. Yes. Don't just uh, take take one person's word for it. Yeah. Um, there are lots of intelligent people and they all have something to contribute. Totally. Um, and I think the combination, honestly, of all of their advice is really the golden um, mm -hmm. um, ticket. So number four, thou shall focus on preventative care. Yep. So angry muscles are weak muscles. This has been my biggest philosophy, epiphany, axiom mm -hmm. from the past 90 days of my life. And 90% of all pain is referred pain. Most every injury can be prevented by strengthening the hurt area or the area around your pain. I'm sorry to tell you that the exercises you want to do the least are the ones you should do the most. Absolutely. And it's the same with stretching too. It's like, I hate stretching my hamstrings and that's probably like the number one most important thing I should be doing. But just let me do, uh, let me do those pigeons all day. I'll stretch my hips. It's true. But well, well, all mm -hmm. four of these carna stones we are going to hearken back to, but yep. this referred pain concept is one that I um, really have kind of come to understand and get behind Yep. in my sort of philosophy of, of pain management and uh, strengthening. 100%. So it's never the, the, never presents itself right where, no. uh, right where the problem exists. Never as it seems, which yeah. is why like when I see someone taking a Theragun and holding it on their pain point spot for 20 minutes, I'm like, I don't think that's what you should be doing. Yeah. Yeah. And when we get into some of these devices, <laughs> a lot of them are like, okay, 30 seconds, you're you, done. You know, the best part about Theragun as a business model, just to, you know, go off topic tangentially a little bit is it's like causing probably a lot of its own issues that then make someone think they need oh, it even yeah. more. There's it's like a self-fulfilling real... prophecy. It's like, uh, you need the Theragun mini now to fix that issue that the Theragun big one caused. <laughs> oh my God. Totally. Totally. Just like, uh, the, uh, industrial complex in totally. farming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So now we've covered our cornerstones. We are going to hop right into our performance devices and, mm -hmm. um, optimization hacks. Everybody loves a good hack. Yep. And we're so, only going to be covering five out of 10 today because this pod was so research heavy so and so meaty. These topics are so, so juicy. There's no way to cover all 10 in just one episode. And before we hop in, we, we want to shortchange you guys. We don't want to shortchange y'all because this is an important pod. So we want to preface that, uh, some of our favorite recovery devices and performance optimization hacks are not really devices at all, but ways of life. So 
some, some things of them are that free. Yeah. Cost nothing. They cost absolutely nothing. And they're just things inside of our uh, choices in life that we can mm-hmm. do inherently mm-hmm. to um, enhance our lives. Um, and uh, remember, money can't buy happiness, but it can buy devices. <laughs> it can't no, buy but better it can't health buy or happiness, health. but it sure can help both. Maybe. <laughs> It can also cause a lot of pain. So our very first performance optimization hack is free. It's something that humans as the only species on earth will purposefully deprive themselves of. Crazy. It's something that will improve physical performance, boost your memory, increase your creativity, and literally make you hotter. Oh, yeah. I'm not talking temperature. I am talking about better looking. Kristen, what, what is this that we're talking about? Are we talking about starts with an S, ends with an EEP, sleep. This isn't a dream. You're not dreaming. <laughs> we're talking about sleep. And before oh, you turn off this podcast, know that in states that have daylight savings, when the clock jumps forward by just an hour to accommodate the earlier sunrise, what happens? We see we- a statistic statistically significant increase in traffic accidents and heart attacks. These are millions of hospital health records being analyzed. And the inverse is true. When we gain an hour of sleep and we roll back the clocks, we see a statistically significant decrease in traffic accidents, statistically significant decrease in heart attacks. I had no idea heart attacks were linked to sleep at all. But that is shocking to see how mm-hmm. vital totally that statistic can link sleep and daylight savings time. Um, well, we live in a world we where, ignore it. I mean, we talk about this all the time. Politicians, gurus, and celebrities talk yeah, about they're all how, bragging about how they only need four hours of sleep how little sleep they need what look a how joke. successful i am i can do this on three hours of sleep and i'm sure what happens is people function for a time uh just like any other bad habit like smoking or drinking too much where they seem to be functioning in their lives and they feel like they are getting mm-hmm. more done but statistics have proven that you get more done when you are well rested and your brain is functioning better and you're happier at work and you're happier in your marriage and you are less prone to injury. The research we did was literally you are more likely to get a raise if you sleep better. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, we could too bad I'm whole... self employed. <laughs> My boss is a huge bitch, but at least I work for myself, as I like to say. Um, you know, there's a there's a reason sleep deprivation is a, t- a type of torture. Yeah. Uh, but I don't want any of our PB lifers to worry. On This Pickleball Life, your hosts, Jilly B and K-Dubs, we don't suffer from any type of sleep deprivation torture. In fact, Kristen, We got to put our money where our mouth is. You know, we're telling these people to sleep. So we better sleep. So Kristen suffers from this very rare disorder where essentially the second she gets horizontal, she falls asleep. I'm going to call this disorder horizontalism. Horizontitis. Horizontitis. <laughs> yes. This coming from the queen of naps over here. Okay, I thought I was going to start making hats queen. that call. That's a uh, nap queen, actually. I should make uh, nighty shirts. I'm ruling over queen. a lot of fiefdoms between tweener queen and nap queen. Just yeah. saying. You know, I just got to have, uh, have, have some backup. So when we. It's uh, not nap queen, it's queen of naps. Oh, thank you. Gotta, you you got to get the cadence. So when we, uh, when we're watching like Netflix on our iPad at night, um, every 30 seconds, I'm like, are you awake? Are you awake? Are you still awake? Are you <laughs> to awake? To which I reply, no, no, I'm not awake. <laughs> It'll be like the best scene, like, you know, guns blazing. Oh, yeah. Like, I'm like, are you awake? And you're like, critical, like, plot points revealed. The plot twist. And then we have to watch it oh all over God, again. Oh my God, it was the husband all along. <laughs> and uh-huh, you're dead uh-huh. asleep. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, man. if all of this isn't enough, you got to remember, beauty rest mm-hmm. is for real. It is. You actually have been statistically proven to look hotter. Yep. After sleeping over eight hours a night. And that okay. is basically the cutoff. It's like less than five, you suck. Over eight, you're fine. So we <laughs> aim for 12 and are happy with 10. <laughs> there was a study where subjects were given photos of people of varying uh, sleep states to uh, grade one through 10 on hotness. 
So those who slept, as Kristen said, less than five hours, who got more than eight hours the night before, were graded super differently. Literally, statistically, you look hotter when you sleep more. What I wonder is, like, did they take a picture of the same person one night sleeping four hours and then one night sleeping nine hours? We'll never know. Yeah. No, they, that's exactly what they did. Okay. Uh, so PB Lifers, what have you learned here? Sleep before you take that Tinder pick. You're welcome. That's why you listen to this podcast. And those of you who are watching on video, I want you to comment in the uh, YouTube, how many hours does it look like Jill and I got last night? Judging by our hotness, how many hours did we get? Thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, <laughs> Kristen, when she said earlier we sleep 12, 10 to 12 hours, no, we, we do not. I'm, I'm pretty stoked with eight very, wow, very okay. She's shying away. Eight and a half. Shying away from the sleep. But yes, a nap. We, Definitely a nap. We actually originally discovered Roger Federer sleeping oh, yeah. uh, 10 hours like three years ago. Yeah. No, and, 12 hours. And so, I took that as like permission granted. That's so funny. Because I think there's a lot of people in the world who feel guilty if they sleep more than eight. And they're like, oh, I, I, I've wasted my morning or I've wasted my day. I mean, so, obviously going to bed earlier is better than probably sleeping mm -hmm. in super late, but you got to get it where you can. And if that's a nap, that's a nap. So neuroscientist Dr. Walker points out sleep is the greatest legal performance enhancing drug that few athletes are abusing enough. He goes on to state Fetter, Usain Bolt, LeBron James regularly get 12 hours of sleep a day. So that's 10 at night and then two hour naps during the day. You know, mm -hmm. maybe it's a dream to get that much sleep in a day, but could we all benefit from more sleep? Absolutely not. And I think Kristen, totally. you, you have- Totally, and a I, no, you're out there thinking, like easy for you two yeah. pro athlete chicks with no kids to say, but ain't nobody got time for that. I gotta, I gotta get up and go. I gotta take my yeah. kids to school. And here's my gift to you. I want you to go into the settings on your listening devices, and I want you to click 1.25x and suddenly you will be listening to our pod 25% faster and that is 15 minutes an hour I have given back to you and you can apply that to all the podcasts you listen to and thus I have given you a power nap. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Kristen. What would we do without you? If you're really pressed for time, 1.5, but you've got to be listening. <laughs> and I'm talking really fast right now just to test to see if you can follow my words in this 1.5x. Oh my gosh. All right. This next uh, performance hack is for all of you gym rats out there. Spoiler alert. You do oh not need a gym or fancy equipment to get pickleball strong. I want to talk about strengthening and physical therapy right now. And I am personally, um, I would describe myself as a lazy athlete. You like are. I love, She's I'm so like a lazy. dog. Like I want to like chase a ball or a Frisbee or like go, you know, hit a pickleball on a court and run around. Um, but I have always hated the gym. Yeah. Like the only part of the gym I like is the like team stuff. Like I let's hate throw gyms. a medicine ball back and forth. Or like let's let's all do like a relay around like ladders and stuff. But just like going to sweaty gyms that no, are, thanks. smell weird and weird. So we have an office here dudes. and I use um, free weights. I have this device called a magic circle that will insert a photo of or me using that helps you stretch and helps you work out. It's very isometric. I use a lot of my own body weight. God knows there's enough to go around for me to get yeah, a workout. So the circle is kind of like a stretch rag or whatever you use in yoga, but you can go Press both direc it. directions. Mm -hmm. So you can also resist in and, and out. Most of what we can all do at home is so critical to enhancing the longevity of your pickleball careers. I spend so much of my day strengthening the tiniest parts of my body. I've had ulnar nerve pain along the exterior side of my forearm for probably oh, yeah. two or three months. And I've been doing these ulnar nerve gliding exercises that pain relieve it but it's only keeping it at bay. And I finally saw my ART chiropractor, Dr. Sean Bailey in Newport Beach last week. And he said, oh, your ulnar nerve issue or your ulnar pain is because you're overusing these muscles in your forearm and you're not using the muscles in your hand when you're gripping your paddle. Again, so that referred pain. It's right. like one weak muscle causes other muscles that shouldn't be doing a job that they're doing to do a job yes. that someone else should be doing and that causes pain to ripple down your limbs. And it's so limbs. crazy because he gives me these minuscule exercises that basically look like this. So I'm kind of waving at you right now, the camera. 
and I'm pulling my four fingers, my, you know, not my thumb, but my four fingers up while keeping them dead straight. And it hurts. It hurts a lot. Like I didn't even realize you have muscles right there kind of at the top of your palm. And I swear after doing this for three days, I couldn't even do it at first. It was like my brain to nerve or to muscle connectivity wasn't there. After three sessions of doing it, I'm doing it really easily. My hand feels stronger and I don't have the ulnar nerve pain anymore. Now, That's this harkens back to another thing. Like I, I had that borderline tendonitis and I was doing the, the flex right. bar. And I think a lot of times it's hard to decide like, well, I feel better now. Do I stop doing the exercise or do I just do it for the rest or of Or the life? exercise hurts. Do I keep doing it's like it? like a retainer after you get orthotics. I mean, <laughs> after orthodontia. Uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about orthotics soon. How long soon. do you keep a retainer? And I think, I think all of pickleball preventative injury care is this, you're dancing this fine line between... I'm doing this exercise and it hurts and you don't want to injure yourself, but you need to strengthen the weak part of your body. And I think that this theme of get advice, get multiple opinions, have a Mm -hmm. team of people that you can call, ask questions. Because if I did not talk to Dr. Sean about this last week, I would Mm -hmm. just still be doing the stretching and Mm -hmm. I'd be keeping the injury at bay, but I would definitely not be pain-free. And now I'm feeling pain-free there for the first time. Yeah. Um, and I think it's the same in golf. I always tell people strength in golf is when it doesn't feel like you're using your muscles. Right. It feels like you're just doing whatever you are doing and it's effortless. Right. If it feels like a strain, like you're swinging your overheads and you're like, ow. Right. Like you need well, to so strengthen that's your, another thing. your I had, shoulder I and had your arm. I had horrible rotator cuff pain after hitting too many overheads. And I know in rec play, a lot of y'all listening probably get lobbed a lot and lob, lobbies and lobbyists and lobbers. <laughs> and, you know, I'm a lobber, not a fighter. And your rotator cuff's going to start hurting. When I saw Dr. Sean, uh, he was like, yeah, your lats are so weak. You're using your rotator cuff for everything. The muscles around your shoulder are not functioning correctly. And it was that advice, plus seeing my acupuncturist, Dr. Sharon Kong here in La Quinta, who said, you are so overusing your pecs. Your shoulders are inwardly rotated. Typical tennis player, pickleball player. Here's my advice for you. Look up at the sky. Mm -hmm. Right? Think about what that does. Lifts your pecs, gets gets your posture realigned, gets you looking up. And between those two pieces of adv- pieces of advice, looking up, stretching my pecs, strengthening my lats, I have no ro- rotator cuff pain. And I saw a doctor in NorCal three times, had two cortisone shots. I, yeah. That wasn't the solution. I think it's so interesting how many of our issues now, they link to holding and linking and holding, uh, looking down at your cell phone. Totally. And I just wonder why we haven't seen a trend where people start installing TVs in their ceiling, like the dentist's office. <laughs> I mean, it you sounds just, like you a just joke. Want, you just want more like, opportunities to get horizontal. Yeah, like you should be putting your <laughs> GPS device in the visor <laughs> in your car. Oh, but man. like the, if you had a reason to look up yeah. at more than the stars, right? I and mean, I, I would think we be able to reverse an entire society's problems of it's a good point. Hunchback. Well, I think PB lifers, if you're going to take anything from this point number two on strengthening, please know you don't need a gym. No. You should be developing, working with a team of people or someone you trust or finding someone new to develop pickleball exercises specifically for you, your body, your weaknesses. And I wish there existed like um, pickleball like TPI, Titleist Performance Institute. Oh, yeah, totally. Where if you guys don't know, mm-hmm. I'm a golf pro, right? TPI is golf focused, but mm-hmm. I'm sure most of these um, could apply to any sport, but it's very functional movement testing oriented. For golf. So it's like keep your arms straight, put your back flat against a wall, and lift your hand overhead until you can't. It's anymore. a test. It's and if a you can make it past designed, your nose, you're okay. But it's a test designed by Titleist specifically mm-hmm. to determine mm-hmm. if, gol- if, if golfers possess the necessary movement patterns and strengths to keep them in the game for mm-hmm. as long as they want to mm-hmm. play. And I'd love to, I, I, I wish this existed for pickleball. Because the other thing mm-hmm. it dictates. 
is how your golf pro, me, yeah, who's not we'll, strengthening we'll you, you I'm going to tell you to go stretch and strengthen, but that's, you know, the doctors and the uh, physical therapists and the, and the strength trainers job. My job is to not hurt you within your limitations. So as, as pickleball instructors, you, you can easily tell people like bend your knees, bend over, what's whatever, but if they physically ask, can't. What's the first thing I ask my students when I teach a clinic? Are you injured? Who, who here's injured? Tell me about the injury. Yeah. I want to make sure I'm not asking anyone to do exactly. something they can't. Exactly. And you know what's so funny is people are shy about it too. Like so They, shy. they no don't want to admit they're hand. injured. And then you'll get like 10 minutes in and they'll be like, well, hey, hey, I did have surgery three I months ago. You. And you're like, what? Hey, I can't, tell I can't me lift my right arm over my, uh, over my head. Is that a problem yeah, for today's that. clinic? I'm like, actually, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Main main thing is uh, don't be shy. Get yourself right, and you know nothing is is worth rushing into a game without a half decent warm up to prevent injury. Well, also, what is the difference between therapy and strength training? Ah, uh, yes. What is the difference between physical therapy and strength training? And I think a lot of people would say. Mm -hmm. that that is physical therapy is rehabbing a hurt muscle and mm -hmm. strength training is preventative care. But Jill would say, there's no difference. And to me, I ask, does that mean that the way you approach physical therapy should be more like how yes. you approach strength training? Exactly. But people go to strength training and they just willy nilly are like biceps, lats, let's go. And there's, there's no real like purpose behind it. Yep. And there is, there is no difference. When we are in physical therapy, we are strengthening our body. We are strengthening weak muscles. It's the same thing we do when we are strength training. Right. And I think that's a lot of why people enjoy yoga and Pilates a lot because they are so specific mm -hmm. and supervised and controlled. It's not just like, all right, go do 10, you know, curls and come back. Mm -hmm. When you're done, it's very much like, oh, your hips are out of alignment. Let me make sure you're here. And are you using this muscle to pull there? And I think that's so important, and especially knowing with the referred pain problem, a lot of times you're dealing with muscle compensation. So you could be sitting there thinking you're yep. exercising one muscle and you're really compensating with four other muscles that shouldn't be. For sure. Well, I think Absolutely. it's time to move on to performance hack and recovery device numero tres. I think we need to like uh, shorten our, our header. <laughs> PE number three, uh, toe spacers and orthotics. We're yep. talking about feet, people. It all starts with the feet. It's and true. this is really where I first learned the referred pain kind of mm -hmm. concept because every time you move anywhere, unless you are a paraplegic in a wheelchair, you're on your feet. And everything starts with that connection to the ground. I mean, there are people out there even um, doing something called grounding, where they're trying to pick up electrons from, oh. from their feet, the barefoot people. So your feet have a lot of power inside of them. Um, and uh, toe spacers are a concept designed. I'm wearing them right now. Oh, baby. If we mm -hmm. can't see them, because you're also wearing another recovery device. <laughs> <laughs> Compression socks. But when you look at baby's feet mm -hmm. what do they in their like? little ink blot, they are triangles. Very powerful shape, right? Yeah. Duck feet, let's go. And what happens is someone somewhere mm -hmm. along the, the way decided that shoes should be pointy. Narrow, pointy. So now we create like this oval kind even of diamond even shape. Even athletic shoes. Yeah. Tell this the, the, the thing you learned uh, about from Born to Run with uh, the marathoners, with the Nike, 1971. Oh yeah, so um, before uh, Nike burst onto the scene, the U.S. had multiple gold medals in the marathon. And then when Nike took over and since the advent of their super famous running shoes, it was like zero never since again. then, never again. Never again. I will fact check that. <laughs> but point being, if you look at athletic shoes, they're curved at the top. Mm -hmm. They're cushed at the bottom, mm -hmm. at the, the heel. Yes, yeah, right? so you can't feel the ground. And then, and then they're, <laughs> the toes are like yeah. really kind of 
way too tight in that pinky zone. So the toe spacer helps regain some of that toe splay, regain balance, prevent bunions, get your bones back in alignment so that yep. we're not all squishing ourselves like we did in the Victorian area era with uh what is that thing called the corset right they statistically proved that women were moving their well, ribs and, and, and organs and out of the way for binding. corsets and, and it was been not good. binding yeah um, um well I have found that by wearing toe spacers just a few minutes a day and have found shoes that allow for more toe splay that I've reclaimed um balance. I've prevented so many issues with my feet. I've suffered from plantar fasciitis now for two and a half years. And it's basically gone. And the reason for me it's basically gone is the toe spacers strengthening my toes. I do this exercise kind of similar where I'm strengthening uh, my fingers, I strengthen my individual toes. It's probably one oh, of yeah. the funniest things the toe, to watch toe down. someone try and lift oh. up their big toe see if you can do this at home uh yeah, put, put your, your ha- foot flat on the ground right mm-hmm. put your foot flat on the ground put your Bare fingers foot. over uh your your toes and try and just isolate the movement of your big toe up and down but and that's then, a hack if you can do it without your hand then try right. and then graduate try and do okay. it without holding your other toes down and then try and do the opposite right try and keep your, keep big, your big toe, toe down, down lift Lift up your other toes uh but what helped me the most with my plantar fasciitis is a couple things uh for me i see plantar fasciitis in people when they're wearing shoes that are too small Mm -hmm. too narrow or when their toe is slamming into the top of their shoe sliding right we play a very Mm -hmm. like stop start sport so my mom is so smart she invented um taking spenco and flipping it upside down and there's a really it's a really tacky black surface that is really similar to it's like a neoprene yeah your wetsuit material but yeah so it's a neoprene and it's sticky so it'll keep your toes from slamming into the top of your shoe i just figured out why you don't like new socks yes i don't want to your new socks don't get through the spenco to get in your shoe So the biggest, biggest, biggest help though for my plantar fasciitis, and I know you and I disagree on the merits of orthotics, it was orthotics for me. And I see a gentleman named Jack at Lerman and Sons in Beverly Hills. They've been there literally for, I think, 50 plus years. And he makes these reverse Spenco orthotics. And I have really high arches, so he puts in a metatarsal pad in them Mm -hmm. that makes me want to kill him for the first five days I wear them. And then it's like, I can't live without my orthotics. And I think what you hate about my orthotics are what I just said, I can't live without them. But all I can tell you is when I am in those things, I am pain freaking free. And I've tried to have orthotics made with people in Orange County, with people in the desert. It has Mm -hmm. not been the same they're either too hard they don't have the metatarsal pad the ones he creates and i'll i could show you these i'll pull them out of my shoe a little bit later are like supple and soft yeah they have some leather and the neoprene communication Mm -hmm. between your foot but hey for someone else the the hard might work better for them it's about finding what works for you right right i think it is what it is at this point in your foot muscles life they have Mm -hmm adapted to the crutch of having the orthotic and it probably like I'm no podiatrist but it probably would take like a bunch of these like minuscule toe exercises and not playing and combination right to graduate back away from the orthotic so yeah. I think at this point think it's just like great that this exists that you're fine and having plantar fasciitis is one of the most painful and distracting things anyone could ever suffer from. And I've tried all the, all the relief therapies, you know, freeze the bottle of water, roll on it, stretch on the ball, stretch your Achilles. Definitely for me, stretching the Achilles and the calves, keeping those loose helps. But what's helped the most is simply the orthotics followed by the toe spacers, followed by properly sized shoes. That's been the biggest help. I've cured a lot of people with that advice from plantar fasciitis. No, absolutely. And um, and I think along with people being shy about admitting their injuries for whatever reason, which I don't think anyone should be embarrassed about having injuries, but I think people should share their, their, their hacks more as well. I mean, I get at some point it sounds preachy, but you know, when I discovered the, um, I learned the cure so, for I my learned tendonitis. I so much more. You know, you know, Google has ruined everything medical. 
<laughs> Kristen's like, hey, Jill, this isn't in the notes. You're going off script. But but here's what I mean. You, you try and Google an issue, a health issue, and it's like Livestrong, Healthline, Health.com, WebMD. And it's the same SEO buzzwords over and over and over. And where you will learn the most is forums, mm. listening to people, I know where you're going listening with to athletes, listening to pros who have really dealt with this in real time and it's and like find stories. someone in australia it's, it's find someone far away sharing. don't don't find the thing that's like web mds yes. right next door like find the wild stuff find talk the eastern to, talk medicine talk to real people yeah. who've had these issues and solved for them and that's how i have found solutions for my biggest problems have not been seeing doctors it's been talking to my team of of art specialists of bodywork specialists of my fellow pro friends of my of you pro golfer like yeah. again Many sources, many sources. We're not saying just go talk to your idiot friends who also are injured. We're saying <laughs> talk to your idiot friends who had the same injury as you and ask them about their doctor and I'll ask them which doctor told them what and, and what worked for them and what maybe they invented um, because there, there's always more than one way to get better. Um, so yeah, toe spacers, check them out. Um, the, the OG ones um, are like 60 bucks, but you can find some, some cheaper versions on Amazon. Some of them you will, will find are a little too, um, too much splay between mm -hmm. the pinky toe and, and the second to last toe. Um, which piggy went to which market there? <laughs> um, so you can actually s kind of trim it down. My mom just uses one between her pinky and her next toe. Yeah. Yeah, and I think people have been doing that with, with bunions and stuff for mm -hmm. years, but it's mm -hmm. like, by that point, you already have the bunion. Like, let's not get there. Mm -hmm. So um, I also wear shoes that are extra wide in the toe whenever I can. Yeah. They're hard to find in certain athletic, um, but Vivo Barefoot is kind of known for that. Um, Ultras. Merrill's. Um, I use True Links. Oh, for, for golf. golf. True Links is the best golf shoe, um, period, full stop. Absolutely. Um, and there's uh, there's the opposite end of the spectrum would be like Hoka's for the record. So if you're like, yeah, I love great shoes that are big and com comfy. Hoka's are the total opposite yeah. concept, but I'm not saying that they can't help people. What were you going to Well, I was just going to say, if this topic interests anyone, there's this book, Born to Run, and I just Googled mm -hmm. it because I can't remember the author, and a bunch of Bruce Springsteen videos came up. So let me oh, put that's in, troublesome. Let me put in Born to Run book. Here we go. Um, this book is amazing. It's by Christopher McDougall, and it talks all about... Um, like the history of man running, right? Yep. Super athletes, a hidden tribe, and mm. the history of why we stood up. Why right. are we not on all fours? Bipeds, and baby. Right. And what did that evolutionary change do to our spine, do to like... And our diet and like what we could reach with our hands probably. Yep. Although monkeys have no trouble getting up the tree. So maybe that analogy um, does not And it work. talks about just the history of shoes and how the more um, cushion that you have in your shoe, the harder your heel and your foot is going to work to find the ground. It's going right. to slam harder. Your right. body's engineered and designed to look for the ground your feet want to feel the ground and how we're not the fastest runner in the jungle no. but we have the endurance mm -hmm. to run slowly behind a cheetah until a that cheetah's time. like are you still back there <laughs> yes <Ha! laughs> all right let's not ruin the book but uh, i do recommend oh, sorry. it <laughs> i i this next uh, recovery device is for everyone who's ever experienced back pain so true story oh about it's no one right none of our none no, of our no sciatica back pain. Has no back pain? nerve issues no disc issues nobody has back pain so we discovered this on our own totally organically when five years ago we were living in silicon valley and i was playing tennis on the team at olympic club playing a little bit of pickleball and i just had this debilitating lower back pain where i would like go for a walk around the neighborhood and my landlord pulled up one time and asked me if i was okay because i was hobbling imagine a 105 year old oh, stooped that. woman holding her lower back walking through the streets shuffling. of san francisco shuffling. unable to pick up her feet yeah that was me and we tried everything saw every specialist you know paid for chiropractor paid for massage nothing helped it it would come it would go and finally we purchased a hundred dollar from amazon inversion table yes the inversion when all else fails gravity prevails it is a spinal traction device you know traction has been around forever 
Uh, it's hard to replicate the feeling of traction unless you are a yogi master and you can uh, stand on your head for long periods of time. But many uh, athletes... But even that, you know, you're not... You're, you're putting now pressure into your spine. Into your neck. This is depressurizing yeah. the spine. If you can imagine, it's like a combination of the mm-hmm. teeter-totter and the monkey bars hanging upside down by your knees. Yep. So children are adjusting their back every day and we don't even realize it. That's funny. But basically you lay down with your feet in stirrups and you can decide whether to go 15, 30, 45 or more yep. degrees Inversion. upside down. And... Um, like I said in the beginning, like 30 seconds sometimes at a time is, is That's really all, I all do. you need. I do 30 to 60 um, seconds a day. Athletes and celebrities like LeBron James, Justin Timberlake, uh, Eva Mendez, to name a few, they use inversion tables for a variety of reasons from fitness to recovery to beauty. Uh, I, can't, I can't say I've researched enough on inversion tables results on beauty, but uh, if that's the case, I will be spending at least 60 minutes a day, not 60 seconds on it. <laughs> it's going to be sleeping in the inversion table. No, again, it's amazing how little does so much. Um, there's also the mini version of it that you have at your mom's house. It's called you, a like, teeter. Push, yeah, you push like your knees away from your shoulders and create that elongation of the spine. Yep, again, and again, like, the idea and the concept is that by hanging upside down, you're taking pressure off the nerves of your spine, which gives the discs between your vertebrae vertebrate room to rest and when I do this this is like instant gratification when I get on the Mm -hmm. inversion table I can literally feel my spine releasing it's Mm -hmm. the best feeling and I didn't tell you this but I just bought what um Paul has been doing with the they're called uh pull-up assist bands so they're this thick they're like you know eight to ten inches thick they're supposed to help you do pull-ups So you buy the thickest, heaviest one you can find. You tie one end of it to something really heavy like your sofa or a really heavy chair. And then the other end of the band, you wrap around your ankle. And what have you just created? You've just created traction. (laughs) No, you just created traction on your hip and your leg. So for me, my right leg is always like a half inch shorter than my left. So I'm going to start using this to traction out my hip. Awesome. Yeah. yeah Just I like remember Paul. Paul showed us now. I was mm-hmm. forgetting. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, the inversion table is a no-brainer. As long as you can um, build an Ikea furniture piece, you can build your inversion table. <laughs> if you can't, I guess you'll have to upgrade to the white glove delivery service. <laughs> but they're really not that expensive Um when you consider how right. much people spend going to the chiropractor weekly. Like if you're that person who goes to the chiropractor more than six times, like you need to check yourself. Like there's something else going on. Yep. Because any good chiropractor I've ever been to doesn't is like, see you, you got to watch out for those witch doctors. Yeah. It doesn't like want to see you every three get days. Better. Get better. Get better. So, so get yourself an inversion table if you are feeling that sort of back pain that comes up like once every couple months which is me and I know it's like I've just been you know lifting too many hoses in the garden one day uh too much and it just resets you like that um so our uh fifth secret hack life device if you play pickleball tournaments you have probably seen this device and uh, I'm going to throw the, the photo up of Jilly's first experience with the device. <laughs> it does involve some horizontalism, um, but in a zigzag chair, as they uh, have really made a plunge into the pickleball world, what are we talking about? We're talking about air relax. And air relax. this is really interesting because every single pro uh, who lives on the West Coast and plays pickleball uses air relax. I have not found a west coast pro who doesn't and then i talked to my friends in florida and they're like what's what air relax this? i think they're based in arizona or somewhere so okay. somehow they've got this foothold uh on the west coast so air relax is a pneumatic compression therapy it's been around really forever it was a medical device that they would use when um, people were coming out of surgery in hospitals and so it would it's for the vascular system right. it would encourage uh, blood flow lymphatic draining and it would really prevent blood clots. So then I guess they realized X amount of years ago, hey, this would be 
amazing not for a performance. Idea. Yeah. Right. For high performance athletes. Especially when you've got that buildup of uh, lactic, lactic acid, acid and Jinx. you need to pump that lactic acid back through um, the heart and the kidneys, I think. Um, it really is just um, anti gravity in a way. It's like helping it improves that upstream blood circulation, blood. promotes lymphatic fluid movement, removes the lactic acid, reduces inflammation, soreness, stiffness. Um, I can tell you that uh, if I play uh, a tournament and normally I'd be sore the next day and maybe even the day after that, if I do two rounds of 15-minute air relax, I will literally feel zero soreness. So it's, it's nuts. It's, it's, it's nuts. nuts. It's a miracle. Yeah, it's it doing is. something Again. to my my lymphatic system. It's getting that lactic acid out. And what's interesting is I was talking to – uh, another device manufacturer, completely different than Air Relax at the, at the PPA Atlanta. And he was saying, you know, I don't like Air Relax. I like my device better because you, you know, where is that swelling that it's pumping going? It has to go somewhere, right? Where is it taking that? So is it pushing it up out of your legs and now it's finding room in your arms and your stomach? So I want to well, do a little bit more research on what are the the downstream effects, but all I right. can tell you is I feel freaking amazing after using it. I think that everything I've ever learned has just pointed back to that the human body is a miraculous thing, and for the most part, it is capable of healing mm -hmm. a lot of things. And I mean, even yep. if you look into therapies and surgeries, they're accelerating what the body is able to do. And it's like, drink water. With water, your body can do great things. It's like compression, get your vascular system working its best. So for the most part, we're just enhancing what the body is is miraculously capable of and, and I adjusting. Think so. in that yeah, I mean, human your body's show we built keep watching to on get rid of waste products. Wait, what was, was that? That human show we keep watching on Netflix is oh, yeah. is is really um, is interesting as well. If you're looking for something documentary like um, about the human body, but um, you know, again, use these things not like a crutch, but as as needed and to continue to enhance what already uh, maintains what, what's that already preventative natural. care. Right. I think that's yeah. really well said. And I just was reading that, you know, waste products, they build up in your muscle tissue post-exercise. This attributes to soreness and fatigue. Your body naturally, passively eliminates those products through your venous system and your lymph system. But that process can take, like I said, two to three right. days of soreness. So what right. the compression system does is it improves your blood flow in that area mimics your body's natural method of removing that waste byproduct. And I mean, this kind of makes me think of um, Jill's brother-in-law is a um, cardiovascular interventional cardiologist, sorry, dealing with people who are <laughs> have had a hard life of abuse mm -hmm. towards their vascular system, right? and now they need a stint put in. And the the sad truth is that most people do mm -hmm. not treat their body very well mm -hmm. and they're abusing the the fact that your body can process all this stuff and uh, hopefully our audience is probably in the other end of the spectrum highly hopefully. athletic and interested and hungry for the information and you can really prolong your life to the point where they think they're you know kids born post millennium mm -hmm. in the 2000s that will be alive for 125 years so if you think of like I'm in my 20s as like I'm halfway to death <laughs> you're not. <laughs> and if you're treating it that way, then you'll probably make it so. But it's amazing what um, what we see now with like 50, 60, 70 year olds who are so fit and so healthy that um, they are like exceeding the tests of much younger people right. who are, you know, eating too many McDonald's cheeseburgers. No, that's, so. that's well said. And I want to give These huge things clog up and uh, credit real fast to Dr. Cynthia Beccaro. If you don't follow her, on Instagram, Dr. C, you absolutely have to. She is responsible for the health and well-being and the continued longevity of innumerable professional absolutely. pickleball players. She's in Newport Beach. She practices ART, chiropractic therapy. Uh, she's also just in general very homeopathic, a healer. She's helped me with so many pickleball-specific injuries. So again, if you're not following her, we'll go ahead and flash her handle. Yeah, um, Dr. C underscore the pickleball doc for those of yep, you who are not doc. on our visual platforms. And I want to just, right before uh, we finish the pod episode, I want to go back to back pain. 
And she helped me with, uh, when I'm traveling, I noticed that after these long cross country flights, you know, my lower back would hurt for a day or two. And, um, sometimes I would like pop a rib, like get a rib out of place from sitting in the airplane seats. So, so simple, $20 on Amazon. We'll flash a link here. Lumbar support pillow for travel. Oh yeah. It has been life changing. Life changing. And it's all because of Dr. Cynthia. Now I travel completely pain-free. I used to just dread even getting on a flight for two and a half hours. So you can drive with the lumbar pillow. You can put it at your desk. Yeah, a lot uh, of people fly travel in the compression socks mm-hmm. on an airplane. It's amazing. Like we take for granted just sitting on an on an airplane, but it takes a toll on your body to be in that air, to be in yep. that altitude. Yep. So what the pillow does is it essentially presses you and your spine a little bit forward. So you're actually not leaning back. You're not sitting <laughs> As all if the way back. Airplane on the seat seats are so forward enough. <laughs> yeah. No, it does. It pushes you forward. But so it's what I the say, lumbar, right? Right. So, so what I do say is it's not kind of like inclined. the most comfortable. Like you don't feel like, oh, this is I feel so good. Kind of like most things in life, mm-hmm. right? If it feels too good, it's too good to be true. So you don't feel great. Uh, but you'll notice you're not in any pain. So that's yeah. the one thing I would say. And you get used to it. You will get used to it. Totally, totally. And um, yeah, sometimes uh, you sit in those seats and you feel like all of your blood pooling in your buttock area. Right? And you're like, oh my God, how is this so painful? All right, so do we have time for quick A dear do- Jilly dear B? Do- Jilly B? We, can, we have time for one quick Jilly B. Oh my God, one. One. Okay, dear Jilly B, how do I keep track of stacking in a game? Oh, this came from a Major League Pickleball team owner. I think she wanted to remain anonymous. Okay, well, she shall not <laughs> be named. One of the Major League Pickleball <laughs> female team owners that you get to guess. <laughs> All right, she shall remain unnamed. Um, so for me, keeping track of uh, pickleball scores I feel like score I should answer this question because you're like too smart. <laughs> well, let me give you how I do it and then you, you can answer it. Um, you're odd or you're even. So if you start, if you serve first, the you score the is 0-0. Zero, zero. Right? The proverbial first server of the game has that wristband mm-hmm. on, their, on their wrist. So <laughs> they the are score the zero is 0-0 girl. Zero, zero. or guy. Is that even or odd? That is an even. So all you have to do is ask yourself, how, how many, many points, points do, do I have? have? That's it. That is it. So if you're confused, don't worry. Just go out and play and think only about that. How many points do we have? Is that number even? Am I even? So if you yeah. start, you're even. So if you have four points, you need to be on the right side. And I think when I first heard this, it was easy enough because you're like, okay, I'm about to serve. How many points do we have? Mm-hmm. That's it. When do people actually mess up? When they, they mess get... up on the side out. On the side out. When, when they, they are the first mm-hmm. receiving. So as soon as you lose the ball, that is the most right, important moment mm-hmm. to not get screwed up with stacking. As soon as the ball goes over but the all net, all you need to know is how many points do we have. Awkward position. When I look at the referee, right. what do I say to the ref when I'm on center court? front of a thousand fans, I look, I let them go and go, what do we have? That's all I need to know. How yeah. many points do we have? And then I know where to stand. Right. So what that means is if you have the first server band, right, or you're playing a rec game and you served first. You're even. You lose the ball and it was one, two when you got it. And now you have one, three, one, four, whatever, one, five. So you have if one. If you have five when you lose the ball, you are still in the odd position when it's odd it's odd right you go back to normal when it's even and this was the thing that I think clicked in my brain the best when it's odd it's like oh we got to do something awkward when it's even you just go to where you were meant to be all along your side right so if it's five you gotta get yourself to the net if you're the even girl and be on the left and if it's four when you get it back uh, when you Mm -hmm. when you lose the ball again rather uh, or six in this case, then you get to go back to your, your right side fiefdom. We so, have one more Jilly B. 
Oh, now we got through it. Okay. This question comes from Thomas, and I don't know where he lives. He asks, Dear Jilly B, how do I speed up my hands at the net? I've been hitting balls against the wall, and that has helped. I try to make sure my paddle's always up, but still, as I've moved up to 4-0 level, I find I'm routinely getting beat on mm-hmm. speed ups. Love your podcast. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Thomas. Um, I have three keys for you to improve your hands in battles. So number one is be super still. You should feel like you have a teacup on your head and it's balancing, it's full, and it's balancing on your head even when you're in a hands battle. Think J.W. Johnson, like the guy looks like he's asleep in a hands battle. Or A.J. Kohler. Yep, be asleep. Um, Something you can do too is take a preemptive step back when you hit a high ball that you know is going to get sped up. Um, Think... Most of the women initiate and counter uh, female pro players, you know, like two to three big steps off of the kitchen line. It just gives you so much more time. But wait, I thought the difference between the kitchen line and the baseline was two and a half steps. Ah, funny. Two and a half. (laughs) But going backwards, it's 14. (laughs) Um, So just make sure that you're not moving back while you're hitting those. So if you're going to take a step back because you hit a high ball, Just make sure when that hands battle starts, your weight is in your toes, not in your heels. So that's another one. Try and see where your weight is during these hands battles. If it's a little backwards or if you're taking a step back, that's a problem, which is why I love this notion of be still. There's a teacup on your head because you can't be shifting your weight too much if you're pretty still. And then number three is your paddle position. So make sure that your paddle isn't just staying up. I noticed you said like I keep my paddle up, Mm -hmm. but it's got to actually stay in front of you. So no backswing. If you're losing hands battles and you feel like your paddle's up, well, your paddle can start up, go backwards and come back. So instead of feeling like your your paddle's up, I'd rather you feel like your paddle's in front of you. I don't mind mind if it's a little bit down. Bam. Yeah, I just out (laughs) out in front. I want it in front. So I hope that helps. And Thomas. compact is what you're saying. Like yeah. kind of elbows in until you really Super have to Super compact. Swing. Elbows in like you have T-Rex arms. Yeah. And I think so much of what's helped me in hand battles is getting pelted in the chest by Jill. No. <laughs> but is the anticipation. You, gre- you recognize my dink's a little high. Mm-hmm. I'm ready for it. You recognize this person's going to speed it up and they're probably going here. You're already anticipating it. And sometimes just like a soccer goalie, you have to sort of like guess and hope. And, you know, if you're wrong, you're wrong. Hopefully you're wrong and they go towards a line and it goes wide anyway. Mm-hmm. But if you, uh, if you stay calm, you keep that teacup on your head, keep your body compact and your paddle forward, yep. no backswing you will find that your paddle seems to find the ball more often than you think, just like the sand lot. Just put that little glove up. And half the time they'll, they'll hit your, hit your paddle, which is why at the pro level, they are so pinpoint about where they speed up. All right, ladies and gents, that is pod number 10. Join us next week. What comes after 10? 11. 11. We are I think going you can to guess doing... the rhyme that's coming. <laughs> we are going to be doing the next five recovery devices, performance optimization hacks. Yes. We're going to be talking about KT tape, creams, compression sleeves, a new device recently approved by the FDA to be sold in America called Beamer. We're going to be talking about heat and ice. Yes, that means we may be going to <gasps> cryotherapy Cryo. this week. We're so going to excited. be talking about e-stem devices, cortisone shots, how to prevent cramping and proper hydration. I am not going to Texas this week, so we are going to continue the recovery theme. Kristen, anything you want to tell our PB lifers before we sign I off? I mean, besides, you know, PB lifers code, 10% off, pbgods.com. Hit us up. Send us your requests for, uh, for fun things you want to see on shirts and hats and things. But also, a quick shout out. To our to our growing fan base, um, I don't know this person's name, but we did have someone seemingly do a pretty uh, pretty thorough deep dive on multiple pods uh, to catch up to uh, to our current, and it makes me uh, really believe that we're doing something that people are interested in. So I hope that continues to be true. And thanks for listening. And, and as always, write us uh, your right dear Jilly B questions to yes. this PB life at gmail.com. Any feedback, what you want to hear more of less of, uh, we want to hear from you. This PB yes. life at gmail.com or drop a comment in the YouTube. We do it for see you. you next subscribe, week. share, see you next week. 
This Pickleball Life is a Tomahawk production, 100% organic, self-made, and homegrown. Music by K-Dubs, editing by K-Dubs and Joey B. Check out pbgods.com and use code PBLIFERS for 10% off your next order. Do you have a question for Jilly B? Email us at thispblife at gmail.com to be included in future episodes. Don't forget to click subscribe. This Pickleball Life.